Story 101 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Bearskin. There was once a young fellow who enlisted as a soldier, conducted himself bravely, and was always the foremost when it rained bullets. So long as the war lasted, all went well, but when peace was made, he received his dismissal, and the captain said he might go where he liked. His parents were dead, and he had no longer a home. So he went to his brothers and begged them to take him in, and keep him until war broke out again. The brothers, however, were hard-hearted and said, What can we do with thee? Thou art of no use to us. Go and make a living for thyself. The soldier had nothing left but his gun. He took that on his shoulder and went forth into the world. He came to a wide heath on which nothing was to be seen but a circle of trees. Under these he sat sorrowfully down and began to think over his fate. I have no money, thought he. I have learnt no trade but that of fighting, and now that they have made peace, they don't want me any longer. So I see beforehand that I shall have to starve. All at once he heard a rustling, and when he looked around, a strange man stood before him, who wore a green coat and looked right stately, but had a hideous cloven foot. I know already what thou art in need of, said the man. Gold and possession shall thou have, as much as thou canst make away with, do what thou wilt, but first I must know if thou art fearless, that I may not bestow my money in vain. A soldier and fear? How can those two things go together? he answered. Thou canst put me to the proof. Very well, then, answered the man. Look behind thee. The soldier turned round and saw a large bear, which came growling towards him. Oh, cried the soldier, I will tickle thy nose for thee so that thou shalt soon lose thy fancy for growling. And he aimed at the bear and shot it through the muzzle. It fell down and never stirred again. I see quite well, said the stranger, that thou art not wanting in courage, but there is still another condition which thou wilt have to fulfill. If it does not endanger my salvation, replied the soldier, who knew very well who was standing by him, if it does, I'll have nothing to do with it. Thou wilt look to that for thyself, answered the green coat. Thou shalt for the next seven years neither wash thyself, nor comb thy beard, nor thy hair, nor cut thy nails, nor say one paternoster. I will give thee a coat and a cloak, which during this time thou must wear. If thou diest during these seven years, thou art mine. If thou remainest alive, thou art free, and rich to boot for all the rest of thy life. The soldier thought of the great extremity in which he now found himself, and as he so soon often had gone to meet death, he resolved to risk it now also, and agreed to the terms. The devil took off his green coat, gave it to the soldier, and said, If thou hast this coat on thy back, and puttest thy hand into the pocket, thou wilt always find it full of money. Then he pulled the skin off the bear and said, this shall be thy cloak, and thy bed also, for thereon shalt thou sleep, and in no other bed shalt thou lie, and because of this apparel shalt thou be called bearskin. After this the devil vanished. The soldier put the coat on, felt at once in the pocket, and found that the thing was really true. Then he put on the bearskin and went forth into the world, and enjoyed himself refraining from nothing that did him good and his money harm. During the first year his appearance was passable, but during the second he began to look like a monster. His hair covered nearly the whole of his face. His beard was like a piece of coarse felt. His fingers had claws, and his face was so covered with dirt that if cress had been sewn on it, it would have come up. Whosoever saw him ran away, but as he everywhere gave the poor money to pray that he might not die during the seven years, and as he paid well for everything, he still always found shelter. In the fourth year, he entered an inn where the landlord 
would not receive him, and would not even let him have a place in the stable, because he was afraid the horses would be scared. But as Bearskin thrust his hand into his pocket, and pulled out a handful of ducats, the host let himself be persuaded, and gave him a room in the outhouse. Bearskin was, however, obliged to promise not to let himself be seen, lest the inn should get a bad name. As Bearskin was sitting alone in the evening, and wishing from the bottom of his heart that the seven years were over, he heard a loud lamenting in a neighboring room. He had a compassionate heart, so he opened the door and saw an old man weeping bitterly and wringing his hands. Bearskin went nearer, but the man sprang to his feet and tried to escape from him. At last, when the man perceived that Bearskin's voice was human, he let himself be prevailed on, and by kind words, Bearskin succeeded so far that the old man revealed the cause of his grief. His property had dwindled away by degrees. He and his daughters would have to starve, and he was so poor that he could not pay the innkeeper, and was to be put in prison. If that is your only trouble, said Bearskin, I have plenty of money. He caused the innkeeper to be brought thither, paid him, and put a purse full of gold into the poor old man's pocket besides. When the old man saw himself set free from all his troubles, he did not know how to be grateful enough. Come with me, said he to Bearskin. My daughters all have miracles of beauty. Choose one of them for thyself as a wife. When she hears what thou hast done for me, she will not refuse thee. Thou dost in truth look a little strange, but she will soon put thee to rights again. This pleased Bearskin well, and he went. When the eldest saw him, she was so terribly alarmed at his face that she screamed and ran away. The second stood still and looked at him from head to foot, but then she said, How can I accept a husband who no longer has a human form? The shaven bear that once was here and passed itself off for a man pleased me far better, for at any rate it wore a hussar's dress and white gloves. If it were nothing but ugliness, I might get used to that. The youngest, however, said, Dear father, that must be a good man to have helped you out of your trouble. So if you have promised him a bride for doing it, your promise must be kept. It was a pity that Bearskin's face was covered with dirt and with hair, for if not, they might have seen how delighted he was when he heard those words. He took a ring from his finger, broke it in two, and gave her one half. The other he kept for himself. He wrote his name, however, on her half and hers on his, and begged her to keep her peace carefully. And then he took his leave and said, I must still wander about for three years, and if I do not return then thou art free, for I shall be dead, but pray to God to preserve my life. The poor betrothed bride dressed herself entirely in black, and when she thought of her future bridegroom, tears came into her eyes. Nothing but contempt and mockery fell to her lot from her sisters. Take care, said the eldest, if thou givest him thy hand, he will strike his claws into it. Beware, said the second, bears like sweet things, and if he takes a fancy to thee, he will eat thee up. Thou must always do as he likes, begged the elder again, or else he will growl. And the second continued, but the wedding will be a merry one for bears dance well. The bride was silent, and did not let them vex her. Bearskin, however, traveled about the world from one place to another, did good where he was able, and gave generously to the poor that they might pray for him. At length, as the last day of the seven years dawned, he went once more out on to the heath, and seated himself beneath the circle of trees. It was not long before the wind whistled, and the devil stood before him and looked angrily at him. Then he threw Bearskin his old coat and asked for his own green one back. We have not got so far as that yet, answered Bearskin. Thou must first make me clean. Whether the devil liked it or not, he was forced to fetch water and wash Bearskin, comb his hair, and cut his nails. After this he looked like a brave soldier 
and was much handsomer than he had ever been before. When the devil had gone away, Bearskin was quite light-hearted. He went into the town, put on a magnificent velvet coat, seated himself in a carriage drawn by four white horses, and drove to his bride's house. No one recognized him. The father took him for a distinguished general, and led him into the room where his daughters were sitting. He was forced to place himself between the two eldest. They helped him to wine, gave him the best pieces of meat, and thought that in all the world they had never seen a handsomer man. The bride, however, sat opposite to him in her black dress, and never raised her eyes, nor spoke a word. When at length he asked the father if he would give him one of his daughters to wife, the two eldest jumped up, ran to their bedrooms, and put on splendid dresses, for each of them fancied she was the chosen one. The stranger, as soon as he was alone with his bride, brought out his half of the ring, and threw it in a glass of wine, which he reached across the table to her. She took the wine, but when she had drunk it and found the half ring lying at the bottom, her heart began to beat. She got the other half which she wore on a ribbon round her neck, joined them, and saw that the two pieces fitted exactly together. Then said he, I am thy betrothed bridegroom, whom thou sawest as bearskin, but through God's grace I have again received my human form, and have once more become clean. He went up to her, embraced her, and gave her a kiss. In the meantime the two sisters came back in full dress, and when they saw that the handsome man had fallen to the share of the youngest, and heard that he was bearskin, they ran out full of anger and rage. One of them drowned herself in the well, the other hanged herself on a tree. In the evening someone knocked at the door, and when the bridegroom opened it, it was the devil in his green coat, who said, Seest thou, I have now got two souls in the place of thy one. End of story 101《Story 102 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Willow Wren and the Bear. Once in summer time, the bear and the wolf were walking in the forest, and the bear heard a bird singing so beautifully that he said, "'Brother wolf, what bird is it that sings so well?' "'That is the king of birds,' said the wolf, "'before whom we must bow down.' It was, however, in reality the willow wren, Zangkunik. "'If that's the case,' said the bear, I should very much like to see his royal palace. Come, take me thither. That is not done quite as you seem to think, said the wolf. You must wait until the queen comes. Soon afterwards the queen arrived with some food in her beak, and the lord king came too, and they began to feed their young ones. The bear would have liked to go at once, but the wolf held him back by the sleeve and said, No. You must wait until the Lord and Lady Queen have gone away again. So they observed the hole in which was the nest, and trotted away. The bear, however, could not rest until he had seen the royal palace, and when a short time had passed, again went to it. The king and queen had just flown out, so he peeped in, and saw five or six young ones lying in it. "'Is that the royal palace?' cried the bear. "'It is a wretched palace, and you are not king's children.' You are disreputable children. When the young wrens heard that, they were frightfully angry, and screamed, No, that we are not. Our parents are honest people. Bear, thou wilt have to pay for that. The bear and the wolf grew uneasy, and turned back and went into their holes. The young willow wrens, however, continued to cry and scream, and when their parents again brought food, they said, we will not so much as touch one fly's leg. No, 
not if we were dying of hunger, until you have settled whether we are respectable children or not. The bear has been here and has insulted us. Then the old king said, Be easy, he shall be punished. And he at once flew with the queen to the bear's cave, and called in, Old growler, why hast thou insulted my children? Thou shalt suffer for it. We will punish thee by a bloody war. Thus war was announced to the bear, and all four-footed animals were summoned to take part in it. Oxen, asses, cows, deer, and every other animal the earth contained. And the willow wren summoned everything which flew in the air. Not only birds, large and small, but midges and hornets, bees and flies had to come. When the time came for the war to begin, the willow wren sent out spies to discover who was the enemy's commander-in-chief. The gnat, who was the most crafty, flew into the forest where the enemy was assembled, and hid herself beneath the leaf of the tree where the watchword was to be given. There stood the bear, and he called the fox before him, and said, Fox, thou art the most cunning of all animals. Thou shalt be general and lead us. Good, said the fox. But what signals shall we agree upon? No one knew that. So the fox said, I have a fine, long, bushy tail, which almost looks like a plume of red feathers. When I lift my tail up quite high, all is going well, and you must charge. But if I let it hang down, run away as fast as you can. When the gnat had heard that, she flew away again, and revealed everything with the greatest minuteness to the willow wren. When day broke, and the battle was to begin, all the four-footed animals came running up with such a noise that the earth trembled. The willow wren also came flying through the air with his army with such a humming and whirring and swarming that every one was uneasy and afraid, and on both sides they advanced against each other. But the willow wren sent down the hornet with orders to get beneath the fox's tail and sting with all his might. When the fox felt the first sting, he started so that he drew up one leg, with the pain, but he bore it, and still kept his tail high in the air. At the second sting, he was forced to put it down for a moment. At the third, he could hold out no longer, and screamed out, and put his tail between his legs. When the animals saw that, they thought all was lost, and began to fly, each into his hole and the birds had won the battle. Then the king and queen flew home to their children and cried, Children, rejoice! Eat and drink to your heart's content. We have won the battle. But the young wrens said, We will not eat yet. The bear must come to the nest and beg for pardon and say that we are honorable children before we will do that. Then the willow wren flew to the bear's hole and cried, Growler! Thou art to come to the nest to my children, and beg their pardon, or else every rib of thy body shall be broken. So the bear crept thither in the greatest fear, and begged their pardon. And now at last the young wrens were satisfied, and sat down together, and ate and drank, and made merry till quite late into the night. End of story 102 Story 103 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Sweet Porridge. There was a poor but good little girl who lived alone with her mother and they no longer had anything to eat. So the child went into the forest, and there an aged woman met her who was aware of her sorrow and presented her with a little pot, which when she said, Cook, little pot, cook, would cook good, sweet porridge, and when she said, Stop, little pot, it ceased to cook. The girl took the pot home to her mother, and now they were freed from their poverty and hunger, and ate sweet porridge as often as they chose. Once on the time when the girl had gone out, her mother said, Cook, little pot, cook, 
and it did cook, and she ate till she was satisfied, and then she wanted the pot to stop cooking, but did not know the word. So it went on cooking, and the porridge rose over the edge, and still it cooked on until the kitchen and whole house were full, and then the next house, and then the whole street, just as if it wanted to satisfy the hunger of the whole world, and there was the greatest distress, but no one knew how to stop it. At last, when only one single house remained, the child came home and just said, Stop, little pot, and it stopped and gave up cooking, and whosoever wished to return to the town had to eat his way back. End of story 103。story 104 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。recording by melvin lee。household tales by jacob and willem grimm。translated by margaret hunt。Wise folks. One day a peasant took his good hazel stick out of the corner and said to his wife, Trina, I am going across country and shall not return for three days. If, during that time, the cattle dealer should happen to call and want to buy our three cows, you may strike a bargain at once, but not unless you can get two hundred thalers for them. Nothing less, do you hear? "'For heaven's sake, just go in peace,' answered the woman. "'I will manage that.' "'You indeed,' said the man. "'You once fell on your head when you were a little child, "'and that affects you even now. "'But let me tell you this. "'If you do anything foolish, "'I will make your back black and blue, "'and not with paint, I assure you, "'but with the stick which I have in my hand, "'and the coloring shall last a whole year.' You may rely on that. And having said that, the man went on his way. Next morning the cattle dealer came, and the woman had no need to say many words to him. When he had seen the cows and heard the price, he said, I am quite willing to give that. Honestly speaking, they are worth it. I will take the beasts away with me at once. He unfastened their chains and drove them out of the buyer. But just as he was going out of the yard door, the woman clutched him by the sleeve and said, You must give me the two hundred thalers now, or I cannot let the cows go. True, answered the man, but I have forgotten to buckle on my money belt. Have no fear, however. You shall have security for my paying. I will take two cows with me and leave one, and then you will have a good pledge. The woman saw the force of this and let the man go away with the cows, and thought to herself, how pleased Hans will be when he finds out how cleverly I have managed it. The peasant came home on the third day as he had said he would, and at once inquired if the cows were sold. Yes, indeed, dear Hans, answered the woman, and, as you said, for two hundred thalers. They are scarcely worth so much, but the man took them without making any objection. Where is the money? asked the peasant. Oh, I have not got the money, replied the woman. He had happened to forget his money belt, but he will soon bring it, and he left good security behind him. What kind of security? asked the man. One of the three cows, which he shall not have until he is paid, for the other two. I have managed very cunningly, for I have kept the smallest which eats the least. The man was enraged and lifted up his stick, and was just going to give her the beating he had promised her. Suddenly he let the stick fall and said, you are the stupidest goose that ever waddled on God's earth, but I am sorry for you. I will go out into the highways and wait there for three days to see if I find anyone who is still stupider than you. If I succeed in doing so, you shall go scot-free, but if I do not find him, you shall receive your well-deserved reward without any discount. He went out into the great highways and sat down on a stone and waited for what would happen. Then he saw a peasant's wagon coming towards him, and a woman was standing upright in the middle of it, instead of sitting on the bundle of straw which was lying beside her, or walking near the oxen and leading them. The man thought to himself, This is certainly one of the kind I am in search of, and jumped up and ran backwards and forwards in front of the wagon like one who is not very wise. 
"'But what do you want, my friend?' said the woman to him. "'I don't know you. Where do you come from?' "'I have fallen down from heaven,' replied the man, "'and don't know how to get back again. Couldn't you drive me up?' "'No,' said the woman. "'I don't know the way. But if you come from heaven, you can surely tell me how my husband, who has been there these three years, is. You must have seen him. Oh, yes, I have seen him, but all men can't get on well. He keeps sheep, and the sheep give him a great deal to do. They run up to the mountains and lose their way in the wilderness, and he has to run after them and drive them together again. His clothes are all torn to pieces, too, and will soon fall off his body. There is no tailor there, for St. Peter won't let any of them in, as you know by the story. Who would have thought it? cried the woman. I tell you what, I will fetch his Sunday coat, which is still hanging at home in the cupboard, and he can wear that and look respectable. You will be so kind as to take it with you. That won't do very well, answered the peasant. People are not allowed to take clothes into heaven. They are taken away from one at the gate. Then hark you, said the woman, I sold my fine wheat yesterday and got a good lot of money for it. I will send that to him. If you hide the purse in your pocket, no one will know that you have it. If you can't manage it any other way, said the peasant, I will do you that favor. Just sit still where you are, said she, and I will drive home and fetch the purse. I shall soon be back again. I do not sit down on the bundle of straw but stand up in the wagon because it makes it lighter for the cattle. She drove her oxen away, and the peasant thought, That woman has a perfect talent for folly. If she really brings the money, my wife may think herself fortunate, for she will get no beating. It was not long before she came in a great hurry with the money, and with her own hands put it in his pocket. Before she went away, she thanked him again a thousand times for his courtesy. When the woman got home again, she found her son, who had come in from the field. She told him what unlooked-for things had befallen her, and then added, I am truly delighted at having found an opportunity of sending something to my poor husband. Who would ever have imagined that he could be suffering for want of anything up in heaven? The son was full of astonishment. Mother, said he, it is not every day that a man comes from heaven in this way. I will go out immediately and see if he's still to be found. He must tell me what it is like up there, and how the work is done. He saddled the horse and rode off with all speed. He found the peasant who was sitting under a willow tree, and was just going to count the money in the purse. Have you seen the man who has fallen down from heaven? cried the youth to him. Yes, answered the peasant. He has set out on his way back there and has gone up that hill from whence it will be rather nearer. You could still catch him up if you were to ride fast. Alas, said the youth, I have been doing tiring work all day, and the ride here has completely worn me out. You know the man. Be so kind as to get on my horse and go and persuade him to come here. Ah, thought the peasant, here is another who has no wick in his lamp. Why should I not do this favor, said he, and mounted the horse and rode off in a quick trot. The youth remained sitting there till night fell, but the peasant never came back. The man from heaven must certainly have been in a great hurry, and would not turn back, thought he, and the peasant has no doubt given him the horse to take to my father. He went home and told his mother what had happened, and that he had sent his father the horse so that he might not have always be running about. Thou hast done well, answered she, Thy legs are younger than his, and thou canst go on foot. When the peasant got home, he put the horse in the stable beside the cow, which he had as a pledge, and then went to his wife and said, Trina, as your luck would have it, I have found two who are still sillier fools than you. This time you escape without a beating. I will store it up for another occasion. When he lighted his pipe, sat down in his grandfather's chair and said, It was a great stroke of business to get a sleek horse and a great purse full of money into the bargain for two lean cows. If stupidity always brought in as much as that, I would be quite willing to hold it in honor. So, thought the peasant, but you no doubt prefer the simple folks. 
End of Story 104「Story 105 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Stories about Snakes First Story there was once a little child, whose mother gave her every afternoon a small bowl of milk and bread, and the child seated herself in the yard with it. When she began to eat, however, a snake came creeping out of a crevice in the wall, dipped its little head in the dish, and ate with her. The child had pleasure in this, and when she was sitting there with her little dish, and the snake did not come at once, she cried, "'Snake! Snake! Come swiftly, hither come, thou tiny thing! Thou shalt have thy crumbs of bread! Thou shalt refresh thyself with milk!' Then the snake came in haste, and enjoyed its food. Moreover it showed gratitude, for it brought the child all kinds of pretty things from its hidden treasures—bright stones, pearls, and golden playthings. The snake, however, only drank the milk, and left the bread-crumbs alone. Then one day the child took its little spoon, and struck the snake gently on its head with it, and said, "'Eat the bread-crumbs as well, little thing!' The mother, who was standing in the kitchen, heard the child talking to someone, and when she saw that she was striking a snake with her spoon, ran out with a log of wood, and killed the good little creature. From that time forth a change came over the child. As long as the snake had eaten with her, she had grown tall and strong, but now she lost her pretty rosy cheeks and wasted away. It was not long before the funeral bird began to cry in the night, and the red breast to collect little branches and leaves for a funeral garland, and soon afterwards the child lay on her bier. Second Story An orphan child was sitting on the town walls, spinning, when she saw a snake coming out of a hole low down in the wall. Swiftly she spread out beside this one of the blue silk handkerchiefs which snakes have such a strong liking for, and which are the only things they will creep on. As soon as the snake saw it, it went back, then returned, bringing with it a small golden crown, laid it on the handkerchief, and then went away again. The girl took up the crown. It glittered, and was of delicate golden filigree work. It was not long before the snake came back for the second time, but when it no longer saw the crown, it crept up to the wall, and in its grief smote its little head against it as long as it had strength to do so, until at last it lay there dead. If the girl had but left the crown where it was, the snake would certainly have brought still more of his treasures out of the hole. Third Story A snake cries, Hoo-hoo! Hoo-hoo! A child says, Come out! The snake comes out, then the child inquires about her little sister. "'Hast thou not seen little red stockings?' The snake says, "'No, neither have I. Then I am like you. Hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo!' End of Story 105「of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melvin lee household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt the poor miller's boy and the cat in a certain mill lived an old miller who had neither wife nor child and three apprentices served under him as they had been with him several years he one day said to them i am old and want to sit in the chimney corner go out and whichsoever of you brings me the best horse home to him will i give the mill and in return for it he shall take care of me till my death the third of the boys was however the drudge who was looked on as foolish by the others they begrudged the mill to him 
and afterwards he would not have it. Then all three went out together, and when they came to the village, the two said to the stupid Hans, Thou mayest just as well stay here. As long as thou livest, thou wilt never get a horse. Hans, however, went with them, and when it was night, they came to a cave in which they lay down to sleep. The two sharp ones waited until Hans had fallen asleep, then they got up and went away, leaving him where he was, and they thought they had done a very clever thing, but it was certain to turn out ill for them. When the sun arose, and Hans woke up, he was lying in a deep cavern. He looked around on every side and exclaimed, Oh, heavens, where am I? Then he got up and clambered out of the cave, went into the forest, and thought, Here I am, quite alone and deserted. How shall I obtain a horse now? Whilst he was thus walking, full of thought, he met a small tabby cat, which said quite kindly, Hans, where are you going? Alas, thou canst not help me. I well know thy desire, said the cat. You wish to have a beautiful horse. Come with me and be my faithful servant for seven years long, and then I will give you one more beautiful than any you have ever seen in your whole life. Well, this is a wonderful cat, thought Hans, but I am determined to see if she is telling the truth. So she took him with her into her enchanted castle, where there were nothing but cats who were her servants. They leapt nimbly upstairs and downstairs, and were merry and happy. In the evening, when they sat down to dinner, three of them had to make music. One played the bassoon, the other the fiddle, and the third put the trumpet to his lips and blew out his cheeks as much as he possibly could. When they had dined, the table was carried away, and the cat said, Now, Hans, come and dance with me. No, said he, I won't dance with a pussy cat. I have never done that yet. Then take him to bed, said she to the cats. So one of them lighted him to his bedroom. One pulled off his shoes, one his stockings, and at last one of them blew out the candle. Next morning they returned and helped him out of bed. One put his stockings on for him, one tied his garters, one brought his shoes and washed him, and one dried his face with her tail. That feels very soft, said Hans. He, however, had to serve the cat and chop some wood every day, and to do that he had an axe of silver, and a wedge and saw were of silver, and the mallet of copper. So he chopped the wood small, stayed there in the house, and had good meat and drink, but never saw anyone but the tabby cat and her servants. Once she said to him, Go and mow my meadow, and dry the grass, and gave him a scythe of silver, and a wet stone of gold, but bade him deliver them up again carefully. So Hans went thither, and did what he was bidden, and when he had finished the work, he carried the scythe, whetstone, and hay to the house, and asked if it was not yet time for her to give him his reward. No, said the cat, you must first do something more for me of the same kind. There is timber of silver, carpenter's axe, square, and everything that is needful, all of silver. With these build me a small house. And Hans built the small house and said that he had now done everything, and still he had no horse. Nevertheless, the seven years had gone by with him as if they were six months. The cat asked him if he would like to see her horses. Yes, said Hans. Then she opened the door of the small house, and when she had opened it, there stood twelve horses, such horses so bright and shining that his heart rejoiced at the sight of them. And now she gave him to eat and drink, and said, Go home, I will not give thee thy horse away with thee, but in three days' time I will follow thee and bring it. So Hans set out, and she showed him the way to the mill. She had, however, never once given him a new coat, and he had been obliged to keep on his dirty old smock-frock, which he had brought with him, and which, during the seven years, had everywhere become too small for him. When he reached home, 
The other two apprentices were there again as well, and each of them certainly had brought a horse with him, but one of them was a blind one, and the other one lame. They asked Hans where his horse was. It will follow me in three days' time. And they laughed and said, Indeed, stupid Hans, where wilt thou get a horse? It will be a fine one. Hans went into the parlor, but the miller said he should not sit down to table, for he was so ragged and torn that they would all be ashamed of him if any one came in. So they gave him a mouthful of food outside, and at night, when they went to rest, the two others would not let him have a bed, and at last he was forced to creep into the goose house and lie down on a little hard straw. In the morning he awoke. The three days had passed, and a coach came with six horses, and they shone so bright that it was delightful to see them, and a servant brought a seventh as well, which was for the poor miller's boy, and a magnificent princess alighted from the coach and went into the mill, and this princess was the little tabby cat whom poor Hans had served for seven years. She asked the miller where the miller's boy and drudge was. Then the miller said, We cannot have him here in the mill, for he is so ragged. He is lying in the goose house. Then the king's daughter said that they were to bring him immediately. So they brought him out, and he had to hold his little schmock frock together to cover himself. The servants unpacked splendid garments, and washed him and dressed him, and when he was done, no king could have looked more handsome. Then the maiden desired to see the horses which the other apprentices had brought home with them, and one of them was blind and the other lame. So she ordered the servant to bring the seventh horse, and when the miller saw it, he said that such a horse as that had never yet entered his yard. And that is for the third miller's boy, said she. Then he must have the mill, said the miller. But the king's daughter said that the horse was there, and that he was to keep the mill as well, and took her faithful Hans, and set him in the coach, and drove away with him. They first drove to the little house, which he had built with the silver tools, and behold it was a great castle, and everything inside it was of silver and gold, and she married him, and he was rich, so rich that he had enough for all the rest of his life. After this, let no one ever say that any one who is silly can never become a person of importance. End of story 106. Story 107 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Two Travelers. Hill and Vale do not come together, but the children of men do, good and bad. In this way a shoemaker and a tailor once met with each other in their travels. The tailor was a handsome little fellow who was always merry and full of enjoyment. He saw the shoemaker coming toward him from the other side, and as he observed by his bag what kind of a trade he plied, he sang a little mocking song to him. Sew me the seam, draw me the thread, spread it over with pitch, knock the nail on the head. The shoemaker, however, could not endure a joke. He pulled a face as if he had drunk vinegar, and made a gesture as if he were about to seize the tailor by the throat. But the little fellow began to laugh reached him his bottle, and said, No harm was meant, take a drink, and swallow your anger down. The shoemaker took a very hearty drink, and the storm on his face began to clear away. He gave the bottle back to the tailor, and said, I spoke civilly to you. One speaks well after much drinking, but not after much thirst. Shall we travel together? All right, answered the tailor, if only it suits you to go into a big town where there is no lack of work. That is just where I want to go, answered the shoemaker. In a small nest there is nothing to earn, and in the country 
people liked to go barefoot. They travelled, therefore, onwards together, and always set one foot before the other like a weasel in the snow. Both of them had time enough, but little to bite and to break. When they reached a town they went about and paid their respects to the tradesmen, and because the tailor looked so lively and merry, and had such pretty red cheeks, every one gave him work willingly, and when luck was good the master's daughters gave him a kiss beneath the porch as well. When he again fell in with the shoemaker, the tailor had always the most in his bundle. The ill-tempered shoemaker made a wry face and thought, The greater the rascal, the more the luck. But the tailor began to laugh and to sing, and shared all he got with his comrade. If a couple of pence jingled in his pockets, he ordered good cheer, and thumped the table in his joy till the glasses danced, and it was lightly come, lightly go with him. When they had travelled for some time, they came to a great forest through which passed the road to the capital. Two footpaths, however, led through it, one of which was a seven days' journey, and the other only two, but neither of the travellers knew which way was the short one. They seated themselves beneath an oak tree and took counsel together how they should forecast, and for how many days they should provide themselves with bread. The shoemaker said, One must look before one leaps. I will take with me bread for a week. What? said the tailor. Drag bread for seven days on one's back like a beast of burden, and not be able to look about? I shall trust in God, and not trouble myself about anything. The money I have in my pocket is as good in summer as in winter. But in hot weather bread gets dry and mouldy into the bargain. Even my coat does not go as far as it might. Besides, why should we not find the right way? Bread for two days, and that's enough. Each, therefore, bought his own bread, and then they tried their luck in the forest. It was as quiet there as in a church. No wind stirred, no brook murmured, no bird sang, and through the thickly-leaved branches no sunbeam forced its way. The shoemaker never spoke a word. The heavy bread weighed down his back until the perspiration streamed down his cross and gloomy face. The tailor, however, was quite merry. He jumped about, whistled on a leaf, or sang a song, and thought to himself, God in heaven must be pleased to see me so happy. This lasted two days, but on the third the forest would not come to an end, and the tailor had eaten up all his bread, so after all his heart sank down a yard deeper. In the meantime he did not lose courage, but relied on God and on his luck. On the third day he lay down in the evening hungry under a tree, and rose again next morning hungry still. So also passed the fourth day, and when the shoemaker seated himself on a fallen tree and devoured his dinner, the tailor was only a looker-on. If he begged for a little piece of bread, the other laughed mockingly, and said, Thou hast always been so merry. Now thou canst try for one what it is to be sad. The birds which sing too early in the morning are struck by the hawk in the evening. In short, he was pitiless. But on the fifth morning the poor tailor could no longer stand up, and was hardly able to utter one word for weakness. His cheeks were white, and his eyes red. Then the shoemaker said to him, I will give thee a bit of bread to-day, but in return for it I will put out thy right eye. The unhappy tailor, who still wished to save his life, could not do it in any other way. He wept once more with both eyes, and then held them out, and the shoemaker, who had a heart of stone, put out his right eye with a sharp knife. The tailor called to remembrance what his mother had formerly said to him when he had been eating secretly in the pantry. Eat what one can, and suffer what one must. When he had consumed his dearly bought bread, he got on his legs again, forgot his misery, and comforted himself with the thought that he could always see enough with one eye. But on the sixth day, hunger made itself felt again, and gnawed him almost to the heart. In the evening he fell down by a tree, and on the seventh morning he could not raise himself up for faintness, and death was close at hand. Then said the shoemaker, I will show mercy and give thee bread once more, but thou shalt not have it for nothing. I shall put out thy other eye for it. And now the tailor felt how thoughtless his life had been, prayed to God for forgiveness, and said, Do what thou wilt, I will bear what I must, 
but remember that our Lord God does not always look on passively, and that an hour will come when the evil deed which thou hast done to me, and which I have not deserved of thee, will be requited. When times were good with me, I shared what I had with thee. My trade is of that kind that each stitch must always be exactly like the other. If I no longer have my eyes and can sew no more, I must go a-begging. At any rate, do not leave me here alone when I am blind, or I shall die of hunger. The shoemaker, however, who had driven God out of his heart, took the knife and put out his left eye. Then he gave him a bit of bread to eat, held out a stick to him, and drew him on behind him. When the sun went down, they got out of the forest, and before them in the open country stood the gallows. Thither the shoemaker guided the blind tailor, and then left him alone and went his way. Weariness, pain, and hunger made the wretched man fall asleep, and he slept the whole night. When day dawned he awoke, but knew not where he lay. Two poor sinners were hanging on the gallows, and a crow sat on the head of each of them. Then one of the men who had been hanged began to speak, and said, Brother, art thou awake? Yes, I am awake, answered the second. Then I will tell thee something, said the first. The dew which this night has fallen down over us from the gallows gives every one who washes himself with it his eyes again. If blind people did but know this, how many would regain their sight who do not believe that to be possible? When the tailor heard that, he took his pocket handkerchief, pressed it on the grass, and when it was moist with dew, washed the sockets of his eyes with it. Immediately was fulfilled what the man on the gallows had said and a couple of healthy new eyes filled the sockets. It was not long before the tailor saw the sun rise behind the mountains. In the plain before him lay the great royal city with its magnificent gates and hundred towers, and the golden balls and crosses which were on the spires began to shine. He could distinguish every leaf on the trees, saw the birds which flew past, and the midges which danced in the air. He took a needle out of his pocket, and as he could thread it as well as he ever had done, his heart danced with delight. He threw himself on his knees, thanked God for the mercy he had shown him, and said his morning prayer. He did not forget to also pray for the poor sinners who were hanging there swinging against each other in the wind like the pendulums of clocks. Then he took his bundle on his back, and soon forgot the pain of heart he had endured, and went on his way singing and whistling. The first thing he met was a brown foal running about the fields at large. He caught it by the mane and wanted to spring on it and ride into the town. The foal, however, begged to be set free. I am still too young, it said. Even a light tailor such as thou art would break my back in two. Let me go till I have grown strong. A time may perhaps come when I may reward thee for it. Run off, said the tailor. I see thou art still a giddy thing. He gave it a touch with a switch over its back, whereupon it kicked up its hind legs for joy, leapt over hedges and ditches, and galloped away into the open country. But the little tailor had eaten nothing since the day before. The sun, to be sure, fills my eyes, said he, but the bread does not fill my mouth. The first thing that comes across me and is even half edible will have to suffer for it. In the meantime a stork stepped solemnly over the meadow towards him. Halt! Halt! cried the tailor, and seized him by the leg. I don't know if thou art good to eat or not, but my hunger leaves me no great choice. I must cut thy head off and roast thee. Don't do that, replied the stork. I am a sacred bird which brings mankind great profit, and no one does me an injury. Leave me my life, and I may do thee good in some other way. Well, be off, cousin Longlegs, said the tailor. The stork rose up, let its long legs hang down, and flew gently away. What's to be the end of this? said the tailor to himself at last. My hunger grows greater and greater, and my stomach more and more empty. Whatsoever comes in my way now is lost. At this moment he saw a couple of young ducks which were on a pond come swimming towards him. You come just at the right moment, said he, and laid hold of one of them and was about to wring its neck. On this an old duck which was hidden among the reeds began to scream loudly and swam to him with open beak and begged him urgently to spare her dear children. Canst thou not imagine, said she, 
how thy mother would mourn if any one wanted to carry thee off and give thee thy finishing stroke only be quiet said the good-tempered tailor thou shalt keep thy children and put the prisoner back into the water when he turned round he was standing in front of an old tree which was partly hollow and saw some wild bees flying in and out of it there i shall at once find the reward of my good deed said the tailor the honey will refresh me but the queen bee came out threatened him and said if thou touchest my people and destroyest my nest our stings shall pierce thy skin like ten thousand red-hot needles but if thou wilt leave us in peace and go thy way we will do thee a service for it another time the little tailor saw that here also nothing was to be done three dishes empty and nothing on the fourth is a bad dinner he dragged himself therefore with his starved out stomach into the town and as it was just striking twelve all was ready cooked for him at the inn and he was able to sit down at once to dinner when he was satisfied he said now i will get to work he went round the town sought a master and soon found a good situation as however he had thoroughly learnt his trade it was not long before he became famous and every one wanted to have his new coat made by the little tailor whose importance increased daily i can go no further in skill said he and yet things improve every day at last the king appointed him court tailor but how things do happen in the world on the very same day his former comrade the shoemaker also became court shoemaker when the latter caught sight of the tailor and saw that he had once more two healthy eyes his conscience troubled him before he takes revenge on me thought he to himself i must dig a pit for him he however who digs a pit for another falls into it himself in the evening when work was over and it had grown dusk he stole to the king and said lord king the tailor is an arrogant fellow and has boasted that he will get the gold crown back again which was lost in ancient times that would please me very much said the king and he caused the tailor to be brought before him the next morning and ordered him to get the crown back again or to leave the town for ever oh ho thought the tailor a rogue gives more than he has got if the surly king wants me to do what can be done by no one i will not wait till morning but will go out of the town at once to-day he packed up his bundle therefore but when he was without the gate he could not help being sorry to give up his good fortune and turn his back on the town in which all had gone so well with him he came to the bond where he had made the acquaintance of the ducks at that very moment the old one whose young ones he had spared was sitting there by the shore pluming herself with her beak she knew him again instantly and asked why he was hanging his head so thou wilt not be surprised when thou hearest what has befallen me replied the tailor and told her his fate if that be all said the duck we can help thee the crown fell into the water and lies down below at the bottom we will soon bring it up again for thee in the meantime just spread out thy handkerchief on the bank she dived down with her twelve young ones and in five minutes she was up again and sat with the crown resting on her wings and the twelve young ones were swimming round about and had put their beaks under it and were helping to carry it they swam to the shore and put the crown on the handkerchief no one can imagine how magnificent the crown was when the sun shone on it it gleamed like a hundred thousand carbuncles the tailor tied his handkerchief together by the four corners and carried it to the king who was full of joy and put a gold chain round the tailor's neck when the shoemaker saw that one stroke had failed he contrived a second and went to the king and said lord king the tailor has become insolent again he boasts that he will copy in wax the whole of the royal palace with everything that pertains to it loose or fast inside and out the king sent for the tailor and ordered him to copy in wax the whole of the royal palace with everything that pertained to it movable or immovable within and without and if he did not succeed in doing this or if so much as one nail on the wall were wanting he should be imprisoned for his whole life underground the tailor thought it gets worse and worse no one can endure that and threw his bundle on his back and went forth when he came to the hollow tree he sat down and hung his head 
the bees came flying out and the queen bee asked him if he had a stiff neck since he held his head so awry alas no said the tailor something quite different weighs me down and he told her what the king had demanded of him the bees began to buzz and hum amongst themselves and the queen bee said just go home again but come back to-morrow at this time and bring a large sheet with you and then all will be well so he turned back again but the bees flew to the royal palace and straight into it through the open windows crept round about into every corner and inspected everything most carefully then they hurried back and modelled the palace in wax with such rapidity that any one looking on would have thought it was growing before his eyes by the evening all was ready and when the tailor came next morning the whole of the splendid building was there and not one nail in the wall or tile of the roof was wanting and it was delicate withal and white as snow and smelt sweet as honey the tailor wrapped it carefully in his cloth and took it to the king who could not admire it enough placed it in his largest hall and in return for it presented the tailor with a large stone house the shoemaker however did not give up but went for the third time to the king and said lord king it has come to the tailor's ears that no water will spring up in the courtyard of the castle and he has boasted that it shall rise up in the midst of the courtyard to a man's height and be clear as crystal then the king ordered the tailor to be brought before him and said if a stream of water does not rise in my courtyard by to-morrow as thou hast promised the executioner shall in that very place make thee shorter by the head the poor tailor did not take long to think about it but hurried out to the gate and because this time it was a matter of life and death to him tears rolled down his face whilst he was thus going forth full of sorrow the foal to which he had formerly given its liberty and which had now become a beautiful chestnut horse came leaping towards him the time has come it said to the tailor when i can repay thee for thy good deed i know already what is needful to thee but thou shalt soon have help get on me my back can carry two such as thou the tailor's courage came back to him he jumped up in one bound and the horse went full speed into the town and right up to the courtyard of the castle it galloped as quick as lightning thrice round it and at the third time it fell violently down at the same instant however there was a terrific clap of thunder a fragment of the earth in the middle of the courtyard sprang like a cannon-ball into the air and over the castle and directly after it a jet of water rose as high as a man on horseback and the water was as pure as crystal and the sunbeams began to dance on it when the king saw that he arose in amazement and went and embraced the tailor in sight of all men but good fortune did not last long the king had daughters in plenty still one prettier than the other but he had no son so the malicious shoemaker betook himself for the fourth time to the king and said lord king the tailor has not given up his arrogance he has now boasted that if he liked he could cause a son to be brought to the lord king through the air the king commanded the tailor to be summoned and said if thou causest a son to be brought to me within nine days thou shalt have my eldest daughter to wife the reward is indeed great thought the little tailor one would willingly do something for it but the cherries grow too high for me if i climb for them the bough will break beneath me and i shall fall he went home seated himself cross-legged on his work-table and thought over what was to be done it can't be managed he cried at last i will go away after all i can't live in peace here he tied up his bundle and hurried away to the gate when he got to the meadow he perceived his old friend the stork who was walking backwards and forwards like a philosopher sometimes he stood still took a frog into close consideration and at length swallowed it down the stork came to him and greeted him i see he began that thou hast thy pack on thy back why art thou leaving the town the tailor told him what the king had required of him and how he could not perform it and lamented his misfortune don't let thy hair grow grey about that said the stork i will help thee out of thy difficulty for a long time now i have carried the children in swaddling clothes into the town so for once in a way i can fetch a little prince out of the well go home and be easy 
in nine days from this time repair to the royal palace, and there I will come. The little tailor went home, and at the appointed time was at the castle. It was not long before the stork came flying thither and tapped at the window. The tailor opened it, and Cousin Longlegs came carefully in and walked with solemn steps over the smooth marble pavement. He had, moreover, a baby in his beak that was as lovely as an angel and stretched out its little hands to the queen. The stork laid it in her lap, and she caressed it and kissed it and was beside herself with delight. Before the stork flew away, he took his travelling bag off his back and handed it over to the queen. In it there were little paper parcels with coloured sweetmeats, and they were divided amongst the little princesses. The eldest, however, had none of them but got the merry tailor for a husband. It seems to me, said he, just as if I had won the highest prize. My mother was if right, after all. She always said that whoever trusts in God and only has good luck can never fail. The shoemaker had to make the shoes in which the little tailor danced at the wedding festival, after which he was commanded to quit the town for ever. The road to the forest led him to the gallows. Worn out with anger, rage, and the heat of the day, he threw himself down. When he had closed his eyes and was about to sleep, the two crows flew down from the heads of the men who were hanging there and pecked his eyes out. In his madness he ran into the forest and must have died there of hunger, for no one has ever either seen him again or heard of him. End of story 107「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」
On this the father was delighted to think that he was going to get rid of him, and had the cock shod for him, and when it was done Hans the Hedgehog got on it, and rode away, but took swine and asses with him which he intended to keep in the forest. When they got there he made the cock fly on to a high tree with him, and there he sat for many a long year, and watched his asses and swine until the herd was quite large, and his father knew nothing about him. While he was sitting in the tree, however, he played his bagpipes, and made music which was very beautiful. Once a king came travelling by, who had lost his way, and heard the music. He was astonished by it, and sent his servant forth to look all round and see from whence this music came. He spied about, but saw nothing but a little animal sitting up aloft on the tree, which looked like a cock with a hedgehog on it, which made this music. Then the king told the servant he was to ask why he sat there, and if he knew the road which led to his kingdom. So Hans the Hedgehog descended from the tree, and said he would show the way, if the king would write a bond, and promise him whatever he first met in the royal courtyard as soon as he arrived at home. Then the king thought, I can easily do that. Hans the Hedgehog understands nothing, and I can write what I like. So the king took pen and ink and wrote something, and when he had done it Hans the Hedgehog showed him the way, and he got safely home. But his daughter, when she saw him from afar, was so overjoyed that she ran to meet him, and kissed him. Then he remembered Hans the Hedgehog, and told her what had happened, and that he had been forced to promise whatsoever first met him when he got home to a very strange animal which sat on a cock as if it were a horse, and made beautiful music but that instead of writing that he should have what he wanted, he had written that he should not have it. Thereupon the princess was glad, and said he had done well, for she never would have gone away with the hedgehog. Hans the hedgehog, however, looked after his asses and pigs, and was always merry, and sat on the tree, and played his bagpipes. Now it came to pass that another king came journeying by with his servants and runners, and he had also lost his way, and did not know how to get home again, because the forest was so large. He likewise heard the beautiful music from a distance, and asked his runner what that could be, and told him to go and see. Then the runner went under the tree, and saw the cock sitting at the top of it, and Hans the hedgehog on the cock. The runner asked him what he was about up there. "'I am keeping my asses and my pigs.' But what is your desire? The messengers said that they had lost their way, and could not get back into their own kingdom, and asked if he would not show them the way. Then Hans the Hedgehog got down the tree with the cock, and told the aged king that he would show him the way, if he would give him for his own whatsoever first met him in front of his royal palace. The king said, Yes, and wrote a promise to Hans the Hedgehog that he should have this. That done, Hans rode on before him on the cock, and pointed out the way, and the king reached his kingdom again in safety. When he got to the courtyard, there were great rejoicings. Now he had an only daughter who was very beautiful. She ran to meet him, threw her arms around his neck, and was delighted to have her old father back again. She asked him where in the world he had been so long. So he told her how he had lost his way and had very nearly not come back at all, but that as he was travelling through a great forest, a creature, half hedgehog, half man, who was sitting astride a cock in a high tree, and making music, had shown him the way, and helped him to get out, but that in return he had promised him whatsoever first met him in the royal courtyard, and how that was she herself, which made him unhappy now. But on this she promised that, for love of her father, she would willingly go with this Hans, if he came. Hans the hedgehog, however, took care of his pigs, and the pigs multiplied until they became so many in number that the whole forest was filled with them. Then Hans the hedgehog resolved not to live in the forest any longer, and sent word to his father to have every sty in the village emptied, for he was coming with such a great herd that all might kill who wished to do so. When his father heard that, he was troubled for he thought Hans the Hedgehog had died long ago. 
Hans the Hedgehog, however, seated himself on the cock, and drove the pigs before him into the village, and ordered the slaughter to begin. Ha! But there was a killing and a chopping that might have been heard two miles off. After this Hans the Hedgehog said, Father, let me have the cock shod once more at the forge, and then I will ride away, and never come back as long as I live. Then the father had the cock shod once more, and was pleased that Hans the Hedgehog would never return again. Hans the Hedgehog rode away to the first kingdom. There the king had commanded that whatsoever came mounted on a cock and had bagpipes with him should be shot at, cut down, or stabbed by everyone, so that he might not enter the palace. When, therefore, Hans the Hedgehog came riding thither, they all pressed forward against him with their pikes, but he spurred the cock and it flew up over the gate in front of the king's window and lighted there, and Hans cried that the king must give him what he had promised, or he would take both his life and his daughter's. Then the king began to speak his daughter fair, and beg her to go away with Hans in order to save her own life and her father's. So she dressed herself in white, and her father gave her a carriage with six horses and magnificent attendants together with gold and possessions. She seated herself in the carriage, and placed Hans the hedgehog beside her with the cock and the bagpipes. And then they took leave and drove away, and the king thought he should never see her again. He was, however, deceived in his expectation, for when they were at a short distance from the town, Hans the hedgehog took her pretty clothes off and pierced her with his hedgehog skin until she bled all over. "'That is the reward of your falseness,' said he. "'Go your way, I will not have you.' And on that he chased her home again, and she was disgraced for the rest of her life. Hans the hedgehog, however, rode on further on the cock with his bagpipes to the dominions of the second king to whom he had shown the way. This one, however, had arranged that if any one resembling Hans the Hedgehog should come, they were to present arms, give him safe conduct, cry long life to him, and lead him to the royal palace. But when the king's daughter saw him, she was terrified, for he looked quite so strange. She remembered, however, that she could not change her mind, for she had given her promise to her father. So Hans the Hedgehog was welcomed by her, and married to her, and had to go with her to the royal table, and she seated herself by his side, and they ate and drank. When the evening came and they wanted to go to sleep, she was afraid of his quills, but he told her she was not to fear, for no harm would befall her, and he told the old king that he was to appoint four men to watch by the door of the chamber, and light a great fire, and when he entered the room and was about to get into bed, he would creep out of his hedgehog's skin and leave it lying there by the bedside, and that the men were to run nimbly to it, throw it on the fire, and stay by it until it was consumed. When the clock struck eleven, he went into the chamber, stripped off the hedgehog's skin, and left it lying by the bed. Then came the men and fetched it swiftly, and threw it in the fire, and when the fire had consumed it, he was delivered, and lay there in bed in human form but he was coal-black, as if he had been burnt. The king sent for his physician, who washed him with precious salves, and anointed him, and he became white, and was a handsome young man. When the king's daughter saw that, she was glad, and the next morning they arose joyfully, ate and drank, and then the marriage was properly solemnized, and Hans the Hedgehog received the kingdom from the aged king. When several years had passed, he went with his wife to his father, and said that he was his son. The father, however, declared that he had no son, he had never had but one, and he had been born like a hedgehog with spikes, and had gone forth into the world. Then Hans made himself known, and the old father rejoiced, and went with him to his kingdom. My tale is done, and away it is run, to little August's house. End of story 108《Story 109 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. 
Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Shroud There was once a mother, who had a little boy of seven years old, who was so handsome and lovable, that no one could look at him without liking him, and she herself worshipped him above everything in the world. Now it so happened that he suddenly became ill, and God took him to himself, and for this the mother could not be comforted, and wept both day and night. But soon afterwards, when the child had been buried, it appeared by night in the places where it had sat and played during its life, and if the mother wept, it wept also, and when morning came, it disappeared. As, however, the mother would not stop crying, it came one night, in the little white shroud in which it had been laid in its coffin, and with its wreath of flowers round its head, and stood on the bed at her feet, and said, "'Oh, mother, do stop crying, or I shall never fall asleep in my coffin, for my shroud will not dry because of all thy tears which fall upon it.' The mother was afraid when she heard that, and wept no more. The next night the child came again, and held a little light in its hand, and said, "'Look, mother, my shroud is nearly dry, and I can rest in my grave.' Then the mother gave her sorrow into God's keeping, and bore it quietly and patiently. And the child came no more, but slept in its little bed beneath the earth. End of Story 109「Story 110 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Jew Among Thorns. There was once a rich man who had a servant who served him diligently and honestly. He was every morning the first out of bed, and the last to go to rest at night, and whenever there was a difficult job to be done, which nobody cared to undertake, he was always the first to set himself to it. Moreover, he never complained, but was contented with everything, and always merry. When a year was ended, his master gave him no wages, for he said to himself, that is the cleverest way for I shall have saved something, and he will not go away, but stay quietly in my service. The servant said nothing, but did his work the second year, as he had done it in the first, and when at the end of this, likewise, he received no wages, he made himself happy, and still stayed on. When the third year also was passed, the master considered, put his hand in his pocket, but pulled nothing out. Then at last the servant said, Master, for three years I have served you honestly. Be so good as to give me what I ought to have, for I wish to leave and look about me a little more in the world. Yes, my good fellow, answered the old miser, you have served me industriously, and therefore you shall be cheerfully rewarded. And he put his hand into his pocket, but counted out only three farthings, saying, There, you have a farthing for each year. That is a large and liberal pay, such as you would have received from few masters. The honest servant, who understood little about money, put his fortune into his pocket, and thought, Ah, now that I have my purse full, why need I trouble and plague myself any longer with hard work? So on he went up hill and down dale, and sang and jumped to his heart's content. Now it came to pass that as he was going by a thicket, a little man stepped out and called to him, Whither away, merry brother? I see you do not carry many cares. Why should I be sad? answered the servant. I have enough. Three years' wages are jingling in my pocket. How much is your treasure? the dwarf asked him. How much? Three farthings sterling, all told. Look here, said the dwarf. I am a poor needy man. Give me your three farthings. I can work no longer, but you are young, and can easily earn your bread. And as the servant had a good heart, he felt pity for the old man, and gave him the three farthings. 
saying, Take them in the name of heaven. I shall not be any the worse for it. Then the little man said, As I see you have a good heart, I grant you three wishes. One for each farthing. They shall all be fulfilled. Aha, said the servant, you are one of those who can work wonders. Well then, if it is to be so, I wish first for a gun, which shall hit everything that I aim at. Secondly, for a fiddle, which when I play on it, shall compel all who hear it to dance. Thirdly, that if I ask a favor of any one, he shall not be able to refuse it. All that you shall have, said the dwarf, and put his hand into the bush, and only think, there lay a fiddle and gun, all ready, just as if they had been ordered. These he gave to the servant, and then said to him, Whatever you may ask at any time, no man in the world shall be able to deny you. Heart alive, what can one desire more? said the servant to himself, and went merrily onwards. Soon afterwards he met a Jew, with a long goat's beard, who was standing, listening to the song of a bird, which was sitting up at the top of a tree. Good heavens! he was exclaiming, that such a small creature should have such a fearfully loud voice. If it were but mine, if only someone would sprinkle some salt upon its tail. If that is all, said the servant, the bird shall soon be down here. And taking aim, he pulled the trigger, and down fell the bird into the thorn bushes. Go, you rogue, he said to the Jew, and fetch the bird out for yourself. Oh, said the Jew, leave out the rogue, my master and I will do it at once. I will get the bird out for myself, as you have really hit it. Then he lay down on the ground and began to crawl into the thicket. When he was fast among the thorns, the good servant's humor so tempted him that he took up his fiddle and began to play. In a moment the Jew's legs began to move and to jump into the air, and the more the servant fiddled, the better went the dance. But the thorns tore his shabby coat from him, combed his beard, and pricked and plucked him all over the body. Oh, dear, cried the Jew. What do I want with your fiddling? Leave the fiddle alone, master. I do not want to dance. But the servant did not listen to him, and thought, You have fleeced people often enough. Now the thorn bushes shall do the same to you. And he began to play over again so that the Jew had to jump higher than ever, and scraps of his coat were left hanging on the thorns. "'Oh, woe's me!' cried the Jew. "'I will give the gentleman whatsoever he asks, if only he leaves off fiddling, a purse full of gold.' "'If you are so liberal,' said the servant, "'I will stop my music. But this I must say to your credit that you dance to it so well, that it is quite an art.' And having taken the purse, he went his way. The Jew stood still and watched the servant quietly until he was far off and out of sight, and then he screamed out with all his might, You miserable musician! You beerhouse fiddler! Wait till I catch you alone! I will hunt you till the soles of your shoes fall off! You ragamuffin! Just put five farthings in your mouth, and then you may be worth three halfpence! And went on, abusing him as fast as he could speak. As soon as he had refreshed himself a little in this way, and got his breath again, he ran into the town to the justice. My lord judge, he said, I have come to make a complaint. See how a rascal has robbed and ill-treated me on the public highway. A stone on the ground might pity me. My clothes all torn, my body pricked and scratched, my little all gone with my purse, Good ducats, each piece better than the last. For God's sake, let the man be thrown into prison. Was it a soldier? said the judge. Who cut you thus with his sabre? Nothing of the sort, said the Jew. It was no sword that he had, but a gun hanging at his back, and a fiddle at his neck. The wretch may easily be known. So the judge sent his people out after the man, and they found the good servant, who had been going quite slowly along and they found too the purse with the money upon him. As soon as he was taken before the judge, he said, I did not touch the Jew, nor take his money. 
he gave it to me of his own free will that i might leave off fiddling because he could not bear my music heaven defend us cried the jew his lies are as thick as flies upon the wall but the judge also did not believe his tale and said this is a bad defence no jew would do that and because he had committed robbery on the public highway he sentenced the good servant to be hanged as he was being led away the jew again screamed after him you vagabond you dog of a fiddler now you're going to receive your well-earned reward the servant walked quietly with the hangman up the ladder but upon the last step he turned round and said to the judge grant me one request before i die yes if you do not ask for your life said the judge i do not ask for my life answered the servant but as a last favor let me play once more upon my fiddle the jew raised a great cry of murder murder for goodness sake do not allow it do not allow it but the judge said why should i not let him have this short pleasure it has been granted to him and he shall have it however he could not have refused on the account of the gift which had been bestowed on the servant then the jew cried oh woe is me tie me tie me fast while the good servant took his fiddle from his neck and made ready as he gave the first scrape they all began to quiver and shake the judge his clerk and the hangman and his men and the cord fell out of the hand of the one who was going to tie the jew fast at the second scrape all raised their legs and the hangman let go his hold of the good servant and made himself ready to dance at the third scrape they all leaped up and began to dance the judge and the jew being the best at jumping soon all who had gathered into the market-place out of curiosity were dancing with them young and old fat and lean one with the other the dogs likewise which had run there got up on their hind legs and capered about and the longer he played the higher sprang the dancers so that they knocked against each other's heads and began to shriek terribly at length the judge cried quite out of breath i will give you your life if you will only stop fiddling the good servant thereupon had compassion took his fiddle and hung it round his neck again and stepped down the ladder then he went up to the jew who was lying upon the ground panting for breath and said you rascal now confess whence you got the money or i will take my fiddle and begin to play again i stole it i stole it cried he but you have honestly earned it so the judge had the jew taken to the gallows and hanged as a thief end of story one ten Story 111 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Skillful Huntsman. There once was a young fellow who had learnt the trade of locksmith and told his father he would now go out into the world and seek his fortune very well said the father i am quite content with that and gave him some money for his journey so he travelled about and looked for work after a time he resolved not to follow the trade of locksmith any more for he no longer liked it but he took a fancy for hunting then there met him in his rambles a huntsman dressed in green who asked whence he came and whither he was going the youth said he was a locksmith's apprentice but that the trade no longer pleased him, and he had a liking for huntsmanship. Would he teach it to him? Oh, yes, said the huntsman, if thou wilt go with me. Then the young fellow went with him, bound himself to him for some years, and learnt the art of hunting. After this he wished to try his luck elsewhere, and the huntsman gave him nothing in the way of payment but an air-gun, which had, however, this property, that it hit its mark without fail, whenever he shot with it. Then he set out and found himself in a very large forest, which he could not get to the end of in one day. When evening came, he seated himself in a high tree, 
in order to escape from the wild beasts. Towards midnight it seemed to him as if a tiny little light glimmered in the distance. Then he looked down through the branches towards it and kept well in his mind where it was. But in the first place he took off his hat and threw it down in the direction of the light, so that he might go to the hat as a mark when he had descended. Then he got down and went to his hat, put it on again, and went straight forwards. The farther he went, the larger the light grew, and when he got close to it he saw that it was an enormous fire, and that three giants were sitting by it, who had an ox on the spit, and were roasting it. Presently one of them said, I must just taste if the meat will soon be fit to eat, and pulled a piece off and was about to put it in his mouth, when the huntsman shot it out of his hand. Well, really, said the giant, if the wind has not blown the bit out of my hand, and helped himself to another. But when he was just about to bite into it, the huntsman again shot it away from him. On this the giant gave the one who was sitting next to him a box on the ear, and cried angrily, Why art thou snatching my piece away from me? I have not snatched it away, said the other. A sharpshooter must have shot it away from thee. The giant took another piece and could not, however, keep it in his hand, for the huntsman shot it out. Then the giant said, That must be a good shot, to shoot the bit out of one's very mouth. Such an one would be useful to us. And he cried aloud, Come here, thou sharpshooter, seat thyself at the fire beside us, and eat thy fill. We will not hurt thee, but if thou wilt not come, and we have to bring thee by force, thou art a lost man." On this the youth went up to them and told them he was a skilled huntsman, and that whatever he aimed at with his gun, he was certain to hit it. Then they said, if he would go with them, he should be well treated, and they told him that outside the forest there was a great lake, behind which stood a tower, and in the tower was imprisoned a lovely princess whom they wished very much to carry off. Yes, said he, I will soon get her for you. Then they added, But there is still something else. There is a tiny little dog, which begins to bark directly any one goes near, and as soon as it barks, every one in the royal palace wakens up, and for this reason we cannot get there. Canst thou undertake to shoot it dead? Yes, said he, that will be a little bit of fun for me. After this he got into a boat and rowed over the lake and as soon as he landed, the little dog came running out and was about to bark. But the huntsman took his air gun and shot it dead. When the giants saw that, they rejoiced, and thought they already had the king's daughter safe. But the huntsman wished first to see how matters stood, and told them that they must stay outside until he called them. Then he went into the castle, and all was perfectly quiet within, and every one was asleep. When he opened the door of the first room, a sword was hanging on the wall, which was made of pure silver, and there was a golden star on it, and the name of the king, and on the table near it lay a sealed letter which he broke open, and inside it was written that whosoever had the sword could kill everything which opposed him. So he took the sword from the wall, hung it at his side, and went onwards. Then he entered the room where the king's daughter was lying sleeping, and she was so beautiful that he stood still and, holding his breath, looked at her. He thought to himself, How can I give an innocent maiden into the power of the wild giants, who have evil in their minds? He looked about further, and under the bed stood a pair of slippers. On the right one was her father's name with a star, and on the left her own name with a star. She wore also a great neckerchief of silk, embroidered with gold, and on the right side was her father's name, and on the left her own, all in gold letters. Then the huntsman took a pair of scissors, and cut the right corner off, and put it in his knapsack. And then he also took the right slipper, with the king's name, and thrust that in. Now the maiden still lay sleeping, and she was quite sewn into her nightdress, and he cut a morsel from this also, and thrust it in with the rest. But he did all without touching her. 
Then he went forth and left her lying asleep undisturbed, and when he came to the gate again, the giants were still standing outside waiting for him, and expecting that he was bringing the princess. But he cried to them that they were to come in, for the maiden was already in their power, that he could not open the gate to them, but there was a hole through which they must creep. Then the first approached, and the huntsman wound the giant's hair round his hand, pulled the head in, and cut it off at one stroke with his sword, and then drew the rest of him in. He called to the second, and cut his head off likewise, and then he killed the third also, and he was well pleased that he had freed the beautiful maiden from her enemies, and he cut out their tongues, and put them in his knapsack. Then thought he, I will go home to my father, and let him see what I have already done, and afterwards I will travel about the world. The luck which God is pleased to grant me will easily find me. But when the king in the castle awoke, he saw the three giants lying there dead, so he went into the sleeping room of his daughter, awoke her, and asked, Who could have killed the giants? Then said she, Dear father, I know not. I have been asleep. But when she arose, and would have put on her slippers, the right one was gone, and when she looked at her neckerchief, it was cut, and the right corner was missing, and when she looked at her night-dress, a piece was cut out of it. The king summoned the whole court together, soldiers and every one else who was there, and asked who had set his daughter at liberty and killed the giants. Now it happened that he had a captain who was one-eyed and a hideous man, and he said that he had done it. Then the old king said, that as he had accomplished this, he should marry his daughter. But the maiden said, Rather than marry him, dear father, I will go away into the world, as far as my legs can carry me. But the king said, that if she would not marry him, she should take off her royal garments, and wear a peasant's clothing, and go forth, and that she should go to a potter, and begin a trade of earthen vessels. So she put off her royal apparel, and went to a potter, and borrowed crockery enough for a stall, and she promised him also that if she had sold it by the evening, she would pay for it. Then the king said she was to seat herself in a corner with it and sell it, and he arranged with some peasants to drive over with their carts, so that everything should be broken into a thousand pieces. When therefore the king's daughter had placed her stall in the street, by came the carts and broke all she had into tiny fragments. She began to weep and said, Alas, how shall I ever pay for the pots now? The king had, however, wished by this to force her to marry the captain. But instead of that, she went again to the potter and asked him if he would lend her once more. He said no, she must first pay for the things she had already had. Then she went to her father, and cried, and lamented, and said she would go forth into the world. Then said he, I will have a little hut built for thee in the forest outside, and in it thou shalt stay all thy life long, and cook for every one, but thou shalt take no money for it. When the hut was ready, a sign was hung on the door, whereon was written, Today given, tomorrow sold. There she remained a long time, and it was rumored about the world that a maiden was there who cooked without asking for payment, and that this was set forth on a sign outside her door. The huntsman heard it likewise, and thought to himself, That would suit thee. Thou art poor, thou hast no money. So he took his air-gun and his knapsack, wherein all the things which he had formerly carried away with him from the castle as tokens of his truthfulness were still lying, and went into the forest and found the hut with the sign. Today given, tomorrow sold. He had put on the sword with which he had cut off the heads of the three giants, and thus entered the hut, and ordered something to eat to be given to him. He was charmed with the beautiful maiden, who was indeed as lovely as any picture. She asked him whence he came, and whither he was going, and he said, I am roaming about the world. Then she asked him where he had got the sword, for that truly her father's name was on it. He asked her if she were the king's daughter. Yes, answered she. With this sword, said he, 
did I cut off the heads of the three giants? And he took their tongues out of his knapsack in proof. Then he also showed her the slipper, and the corner of the neckerchief, and the bit of the night dress, whereon she was overjoyed, and said that he was the one who had delivered her. On this they went together to the old king, and fetched him to the hut. She led him into her room, and told him that the huntsman was the man who had really set her free from the giants. And when the aged king saw all the proofs of this, he could no longer doubt, and said that he was very glad he knew how everything had happened, and that the huntsman should have her to wife, on which the maiden was glad at heart. Then she dressed the huntsman as if he were a foreign lord, and the king ordered a feast to be prepared. When they went to table, the captain sat on the left side of the king's daughter, but the huntsman was on the right, and the captain thought he was a foreign lord who had come to visit. When they had eaten and drunk, the old king said to the captain that he would set before him something which he must guess. Supposing anyone said that he had killed the three giants and were asked where the giants' tongues were, and he were forced to go out and look, and there were none in their heads. How could that happen? The captain said. Then they cannot have had any. Not so, said the king. Every animal has a tongue. And then he likewise asked what any one would deserve who made such an answer. The captain replied, He ought to be torn in pieces. Then the king said he had pronounced his own sentence, and the captain was put in prison, and then torn in four pieces. But the king's daughter was married to the huntsman, and after this he brought his father and mother, and they lived with their son in happiness. And after the death of the old king, he received the kingdom. End of story 111story 112 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida household tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Flail from Heaven A countryman was once going out to plough with a pair of oxen. When he got to the field, both the animal's horns began to grow, and went on growing, and when he wanted to go home, they were so big that the oxen could not get through the gateway for them. By good luck, a butcher came by just then, and he delivered them over to him, and made the bargain in this way, that he should take the butcher a measure of turnip seed, and then the butcher was to count him out a Brabant thaler for every seed. I call that well sold. The peasant now went home, and carried the measure of turnip seed to him on his back. On the way, however, he lost one seed out of the bag. The butcher paid him justly as agreed on, and if the peasant had not lost the seed, he would have had one thaler the more. In the meantime, when he went on his way back, the seed had grown into a tree which reached up to the sky. Then thought the peasant, As thou hast the chance, thou must just see what the angels are doing up there above, and for once have them before thine eyes. So he climbed up, and saw that the angels above were threshing oats, and he looked on. While he was thus watching them, he observed that the tree on which he was standing was beginning to totter. He peeped down, and saw that someone was just going to cut it down. If I were to fall down from hence, it would be a bad thing, thought he, and in his necessity he did not know how to save himself better than by taking the chaff of the oats, which lay there in heaps, and twisting a rope of it, he likewise snatched a hoe and a flail, which were lying about in heaven, and let himself down by the rope. But he came down on the earth exactly in the middle of a deep, deep hole, 
so it was a real piece of luck that he had brought the hoe for he hoed himself a flight of steps with it and mounted up and took the flail with him as a token of his truth so that no one could have any doubt of his story end of story one hundred and twelve